Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about the election, as everybody has been forever. For at least four years. Very important disclaimer, we are recording this before the election. Ideally, this is going out at the latest on the day of the American election. So we don't know the results and we don't know what has happened in the last couple of days and for the day of the election. So you, future listener, could be listening while we are following the results and Weeping. I, I mean, I think no, no matter what the results are, I feel like we're probably going to be weeping just as a general rule mm, after yeah. all of this stress. But anyway, yes, we're going to talk about elections. Specifically, we're going to revisit a video that we made four, four years, years ago, ago, just in the lead up to the 2016 election. The video is about the word ambition and about electoral vocabulary. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're not specifically talking about politics in the sense of individual people, they'll come up a bit, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the language of elections. Yeah, the language and the institutions. Mm -hmm. And with a focus on American, but not only on American. No. So before we get to that, one patron to thank, a new patron, Shauna or Sinead Young. Or or Shauna or Shawnee. So I did a bit of research because I'm fascinated by names. And so, yeah, this is a Celtic name. Mm -hmm. So depending on who you ask, found a few possible pronunciations. So those are the the three that... that Shauna, Shawnee, or Sinead. Sinead, yeah. Whichever one of you is pronounced, or if it's something else, please let us know. We'd be very interested to know what pronunciation you use. But in any case, however you say your name... (laughs) Thank you very much for your support. Absolutely. Thank you. (laughs) Really appreciate it. All right. Next, we have our cocktail. Indeed. I searched for election cocktail recipes. It was very amusing to realize a whole bunch of hits came up and they were all Mm. lists of election cocktails and they were all from 2016 (laughs) and they were all articles saying, we're all going to need a drink. Here's some things you can drink on the night of the election. But I thought it was really interesting that there were hardly any from 2020. Mm -hmm. Even though surely we need a drink even more this year, frankly. People are too sober and serious about this. Yeah, I I think I think it's harder to make it make the frivolous articles that you, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, not the 2016 was a frivolous election by any means, but I guess it was still possible to kind of be like, well, ha ha ha, let's get through this. And I don't Mm -hmm. think people are actually able to even be that level of deadly serious now. Everything is too and everything is too bad. Yeah. Not just the election. So anyway, having looked at the 2016 possibilities, we have settled on a ballot cocktail, mm-hmm. which is the recipe I used anyway, specifically called for Maker's Mark bourbon, sweet vermouth, dry vermouth, bitters, and a sugar cube and orange peel. Mm-hmm. And we used Dole vermouth, by the way, both <laughs> vermouths. So here we go. Since Mark's in a bit of a bourbon kick right now. So yeah. we actually happen to have the right bourbon in the house. It's nice. Oh, yeah. I like that. It's got some sourness because of the dry vermouth, I guess, as well as... So it's not just the sweetness like a Manhattan or something. Well, the bitterness, mm. yeah. It's not too, too, sweet. too sweet. Which bitters did you use? Just, just Angostura. Angostura. Yeah. Right. Okay. When it calls for just bitters. Right. I mean, if we make it again, you could try something different. Like the orange Angostura would be good, probably, yeah. given there's a lot of orange in it. But you want to know what it's like with the basic, I think. Sure. Anyway, yeah, quite tasty. All right. Well, with that to fortify us... Would you like to introduce the voiceover for Ambition? Sure. So as as we said, you know, this was originally a video made four years ago. And the word ambition itself was the jumping off point here. It was one that I often enjoyed talking about with my students. This is one that I, you know, always highlighted with them. And it has this kind of surprising etymology and it's sort of background in Roman politics and how that works. So there's a lot to kind of go on there. And since, well, you know, politics was very much in the news four Mm -hmm. years ago, and indeed it is now as well, it seemed like a fitting time then to do the video and a fitting time now to do this podcast. But it was more than just a rundown of political vocab, you know, political etymology, because, you know, a lot of people have done that 
Right, right. You, you know, at that time in 2016, there was a, a slew of articles about, you know, here are all the political words and the etymologies of those words. So I need to figure out something more to do than just that. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, there were a bunch, the illusionist podcast had an episode at the time. And I think she's also done, did another one on political vocabulary since, or, or political language since. And another good one at that time was Mashed Radish, John Kelly. Was doing blog posts. Who was yeah. doing blog posts at that time. He now works for Emojipedia. Mm -hmm. But he had an excellent blog post on the word candidate. And of course, there's lots of others out there, but those are just two that I found particularly good at that time. So I was inspired by that, but I figured I needed to do something more because they did such a good job of it. So I wanted to add a further dimension then of how language, how language change and how changing values sort of go hand in hand, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the vocabulary is a kind of barometer for of how political change and yeah. social change functions. Yeah. And so our, our words reflect our current value systems and both of those things are changeable and both of those change together. And as with, for instance, the both positive and pejorative senses of ambition, right? Ambition can be seen as a very positive thing or a very negative thing as we'll see. Yeah. We'll talk about that. And this, this idea of kind of using one to track the other is mm -hmm. a kind of central premise of, you know, all the endless knot productions and indeed of my dissertation. So this was, <laughs> you know, that was in my wheelhouse. Yeah. And so that's the direction I took. Okay. So let's listen to that voiceover and then can pick apart some stuff and add to it and talk a little bit about how things have or haven't changed mm -hmm. in the four years since then. Times change, and so do words. Generally today we think of ambition as a positive thing, as in the ambitious young go-getter. But when the word entered the English language from French in the 14th century, it started out with the negative sense of greed for success. For instance, the Bishop Reginald Peacock writes about vices such as pride, ambition, and vainglory in the 15th century, and in the 16th writer Thomas Nash calls ambition any puffed up greedy humour of honour or preferment. You see, to the medieval mind, ambition, wanting to rise in the world, was a sin. God put people, and indeed everything in creation, into a rigid hierarchical order, and you were where you were because God wanted you to be there. This notion is called the great chain of being, with God at the very top, and in descending order, the ranks of angels, people, animals, plants, and objects. So if you're a peasant, trying to become a lord is going against God's plans. Even in Milton's poem Paradise Lost, written in the 17th century, Satan's sin in rebelling against God stems from pride and worse ambition. But gradually a less pejorative sense of the word came to be used more and more, as less negative ideas about ambition spread as well, and by the beginning of the 19th century Milton's figure of Satan was being reinterpreted by the Romantic poets, like Byron and Shelley, as a heroic figure. And while today the negative sense of ambition is still possible, for example ambition is often criticised in women, the positive sense is more common, with the pejorative sense having to be made explicit in phrases such as overly ambitious. But where does the word ambition actually come from? It's a kind of metaphor, coming from Latin ambitio from the verb ambire, which literally means to go around, from ambi around or about, and the verb ire to go. This figurative sense grew out of Roman politics. You see, if a Roman were running for political office, he would go about soliciting votes and support, and so ambitio came to mean canvassing for votes, which could involve flattery and even bribery, so that laws were passed to try to control it. Thus ambitio came to develop the sense of corruption or greed for office, which is how it passed through medieval Latin and French into the pejorative sense in English in the 14th century. Of course today we don't think of canvassing as an underhanded action, it's a legitimate part of the political process another example of changing values. But etymologically speaking anyways, canvassing used to be part of quite a different process. You see canvas the activity comes from canvas the cloth, and originally refers to tossing someone about in a canvas sheet as you might with a small child as a game, and perhaps also to a kind of winnowing process, separating grain from chaff. From this it developed the metaphorical sense of to discuss or examine thoroughly, and from there somehow, though no one's quite sure how, the modern sense of to solicit votes. By the way, the noun canvas comes through Latin cannabis, ultimately from a root referring to the fibre hemp, also the source of those English words. Which reminds me of the Liberal campaign plank in the last Canadian election about legalising marijuana. 
Though the incumbent Conservative government accused their rivals of over-permissiveness, it didn't stop the Liberals from winning the election. Another example of changing values, I suppose. Speaking of cloth and textiles, it's from this area that we get another common electioneering term, taking us once again to the world of ancient Roman elections. One running for office in Roman elections was commonly called a candidatus, giving us the English word candidate. Candidatus literally means white, coming from a root meaning to shine, and refers to the extra white toga the candidate would wear when canvassing for those votes, symbolizing his purity. We also get the word candidate from this root, a quality modern candidates certainly wish to project in their campaigns. The candidatus would have with him in his canvassing a slave called a nomenclator, literally name caller, whose job it was to know the names of all the electors the candidate talked to. From the same root, by the way, we get the English word nomenclature, and the more formal nomenclature for a candidatus is a petitor, from the root petera to seek or attack, and fellow candidates are called competitores, from which we get competitors. So in the competitive democratic process there's an etymological justification for those attack ads, if not an ethical one. Speaking of the democratic process, the word democracy comes from Greek and is often explained as literally meaning rule of the people. The first part, demos, meaning people, or perhaps more accurately, the common people, comes from a Proto-Indo-European root that means to divide, and so means a group in the sense of a part. Fitting, I guess, since in the original ancient Athenian democracy only the freeborn Athenian male segment of the population had the right to vote. We could set the word democracy against the word monarchy, literally rule of one, mono meaning one in Greek. But you'll notice the second part of monarchy comes from the root archein, meaning to begin, rule, or command, thus appropriately the source of political power. But the second element of the word democracy, Greek kratos, means strength and has connotations of violence, coming ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root that means hard. And indeed though today we tend to think of democracy in mostly positive terms, the same was not true in ancient Greece, where attitudes to democracy were decidedly mixed. Indeed philosophers such as Aristotle and Plato, much vaunted today, were quite critical of democracy, which they might almost gloss as mob rule, again an example of how values have changed. Today, of course, from this same root we get the word Democrat to refer to one of two main political parties in the United States. Funny thing is, the Democratic Party used to be the Republican Party. Until 1828 the Democratic Party used to be called the Democratic Republican Party or simply the Republican Party, until the word Republican was dropped. In fact, the term Democratic was initially an insult, associating them with populism tantamount to mob rule, until the party decided to embrace their populist associations and drop the word Republican from their name. Then, in 1854 the Republican Party we know today was formed from Democrats and Whig Party members who opposed slavery. On the other hand, until well into the 20th century, the Democratic Party used to represent a politically conservative constituency. Once again, funny how things change. By the way, we have 19th century caricaturist Thomas Nast to thank for popularizing the Democratic donkey and inventing the Republican elephant. The donkey was originally a pun on President Jackson's name think jackass, and was used as a criticism implying stubbornness, until the party itself adopted the symbol for its common man implications. Turns out there really is a lot of flip-flopping in politics. Oh, and that name Republican? The word Republic comes from Latin res meaning thing and publica public, so literally the public thing. Latin publicus is related to another Latin word, populus, close in sense to Greek demos, thus meaning people. In fact, we get the English word people through Anglo-Norman French from the same Latin word. And of course we can see the word popular in there as well, reminding us of the popularism that was such a sticking point in the political attitudes of both the ancient world and 19th century America. Another word for a populist is a demagogue, formed from that same Greek word demos. The US government was in some ways consciously modeled on the Republic of ancient Rome, hence the cachet of the word Republican in American political circles from early on. But getting back to the election trails, we can see an interesting etymological parallel to the Latin formed word Republic. When candidates are out canvassing we can say that they are on the hustings. The word husting comes from Old Norse hus meaning house and thing meaning, well, thing. But thing also used to have the sense of meeting or council, so the hus thing was the meeting house, and the plural hustings came to refer to temporary platforms for political speeches, and then the campaigning process itself. Coming originally from a Proto-Indo-European root meaning stretch, the word thing came to have the sense of time, as in a stretch of time, in early Germanic and from that the appointed time for the meeting of a judicial or legislative assembly, and then the assembly itself. From there thing transferred in sense from the subject matter of the assembly to any matter or thing. A long way to go for such an unprepossessing word. In Old Norse the main judicial legislative assembly was called the all thing, 
literally the All Meeting, and this is still the name of the current national parliament in Iceland, making it arguably the oldest extant democracy, though there are competing claims for that title. Another contribution to political language that Old Norse made is, surprisingly, in the vocabulary of Canadian politics. The common name for an electoral district in Canada is a riding, though there is a folk etymology that this comes from the idea that it's the area a rider can cover in a single day, the true source of the word is Old Norse thriðjungr, literally a third part of something. Originally referring to the three districts into which Yorkshire England is divided, riding is preserved in the specialised sense of an electoral district in Canadian English. The root of politics is the ancient Greek city-state, literally. The ancient Greek polis means city-state, from a Proto-Indo-European root that means citadel or fortified high place. We also get the word policy from this same Greek root, and policies should really be the main focus of any politician. By the way, the word police likewise comes from this root, as their main job is maintaining civil order. In ancient Athens, politics and policy were supposed to be important to all the citizens, as it was a direct democracy, meaning that the people voted not for politicians, political representatives, but directly for policy, such as new laws or other affairs of state. Of course, in practice, some citizens with more expert knowledge tended to lead the politics and policy, while many individuals, although they did their duty and voted, tended to be more concerned with their own private affairs than the affairs of state, and for that reason they were termed idiotes, from a root that means personal or private. We get the words idiom and idiosyncrasy from this root, as well as the word idiot, because the word came to be used pejoratively of people who didn't take an interest in city affairs. When early 20th century psychologist and eugenicist Henry Goddard devised categories of mental retardation on the basis of IQ scores, he termed those with scores between 0 and 25 idiots, 26 to 50 imbeciles, and 51 to 70 morons, but these terms are now considered offensive, another example of changing values. So while we shouldn't call people who don't concern themselves with affairs of state idiots, this etymology does highlight the importance of being aware of the policies of our modern political world. In our modern democracies we no longer vote directly on our laws as the ancient Athenians did, but instead elect legislators, politicians who enact laws, for that purpose. The words elect and election, from Latin ex and legera, literally mean to pick out. The Latin verb legera, which also gives us words such as select, collect, neglect, elegant and elite, think picked out from the crowd, also had a secondary meaning of to read, whence the words legible and lecture. If we go back further to Proto-Indo-European, we come to a root which means to collect, which also probably leads to another Latin word, lex, meaning law, from the idea of a collection of laws. We inherited this root in the English words legal and legislate, so there is an etymological connection between those legislators seeking election. Although the word law looks a bit similar to this root, it's actually etymologically unconnected, coming through Old Norse from a root which means to lay, as laws are something laid down. Once we've gone to the polls, we say we've given our elected officials a mandate to govern. The word poll, coming into English in the 13th century, originally meant head, and came from a Middle Dutch word that meant top or summit. By the 17th century the word had developed its collection of votes sense from the idea of counting heads. But that's not the only body part in political vocabulary, because mandate comes from the Latin words manus, hand, and dare, to give, so literally to put in the hand. The word command, by the way, is also from the same source. And this word nicely suggests that the power politicians wield truly comes from the electorate, so make sure you get out and vote. These body part words might suggest another metaphor for the structure of society, the body politic, with the head of state and the citizen body. But getting back to classical influences on the US political system, one of the most notable examples is the legislative body called the Senate, which takes its name from the ancient Roman Senatus, which started as an appointed council of elders, then as a body of ex-magistrates became one of the chief governmental institutions of Rome. And if looking at the makeup of the US Senate makes you think they're just a bunch of old white guys, you're not far from the truth, etymologically speaking. Not only did most of them start off as candidatus, Senate comes from a root that means old, related to the words senior, reflecting the value the Romans placed on the wisdom of their elders, and senile, which may suggest something about how modern values have shifted. Not that senators are senile, of course. The US Senate, along with the House of Representatives, together make up Congress, a word that comes from Latin roots but does not reflect a Roman institution. Coming from com, meaning together, and gradi, to go or step, Congress is thus related to other step words such as gradual, grade, and progress. The Latin word congressus could mean a friendly meeting or a hostile encounter. I'll leave it to you to decide which applies to the US Congress. 
but it's another example of the changing senses of words over time. Both the Latin and English words can also refer to a sexual encounter, which of course is entirely irrelevant to politics. The more specialized sense of a meeting of delegates dates from the 17th century, and the political assembly sense from the 18th. Other English-speaking countries like Britain, Canada, and Australia, instead of having a congress like the US, have parliaments as their national deliberative bodies. We get the word parliament from the Anglo-Norman French of the Middle Ages, the word parler meaning talk, which some might say is all they do in parliaments. By the way, from this route we also get the words parlance, parley, and parlour, evidently a room set aside for conversation. But it's not just the word that has a medieval connection. When the old medieval Westminster Palace, which at that point housed the British Parliament, burned down in 1834, it was replaced by the current buildings built in the Gothic Revival style, with medieval style pointed arches and elongated vertical proportions, thus symbolically reaffirming the British commitment to the medieval institution of the monarchy in the face of the trend towards revolution and republicanism in places like the United States and France. Compare this with the American Capitol Hill in its neoclassical style, with Greek pillars and Roman rounded arches. Unlike the US, Canada did not rebel from British rule, and so, fittingly, the Canadian Parliament buildings are also built in the Gothic style. Etymology, architecture, and history all going hand in hand. Incidentally, if we dig further back in the etymology of Parliament, we see the word comes through Latin from Greek parabole, meaning comparison, from para meaning beside, and ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root meaning to throw. In addition to obviously parabola and parable, this Indo-European root also gives us words such as symbol, devil, kill, and problem, make of that what you will, as well as the word ball, not the round thing you throw, but the dance. But it's the other type of ball we turn to finally, as it's related to another election word, ballot, which we inherited from Italian. You see, to have a secret vote, a word which by the way comes from Latin meaning promise or wish, one would once drop a small coloured ball into a container the colour black often indicating a negative vote, thus giving us the term blackballed. The Proto-Indo-European root that lies behind this word, meaning to blow, inflate, or swell, also gives us such words as fool, phallus, and bollocks, a somewhat rude British term for testicles. But lest we cynically decide that politicians are a bunch of foolish blowhard dicks talking bollocks, instead we might remind ourselves when we cast our ballots to elect someone with the ambition to become our political representative, that though a society's values may change over time and the language change with it, a vote still should be able to force those politicians to carry out the will of the people. It's the democratic way, after all. Okay, I know you have a bunch of things you want to talk about, but one of the things that was not fully, you didn't go into great detail about, and without the visuals is a little yeah, harder to pick up I on. I hinted at it with the visuals, but yeah. Is you mentioned ambition as, so you talked at the beginning about it being, is it pejorative or mm -hmm. praise? And one thing you mentioned was how it can be used when used of a woman, it has been mm -hmm. often uh, pejorative, particularly pejorative. And the picture you have in the video is of Clinton, because of course at the time Hillary Clinton, you know, that was something being thrown at her. Yeah. And I will say that in our comments to that video, mm -hmm. one of the most common comments we got was, hey, we there's no problem with women being ambitious. How dare, you know, essentially arguing with that point. And it's a tiny, it's one line in the whole video and mm -hmm. it's one throwaway and we just have a picture of Hillary. Mm -hmm. And yet I'd say a good like quarter of the video videos comments mentioned it in some way or not, mm -hmm. you know, really hit a nerve. Right. Uh, and generally it's a few people saying, yeah, that's a problem. But mostly people saying that's total bollocks to say that there's any prejudice against women being ambitious. Everyone loves women who are ambitious. It's, the big problem is women feel that they have to be ambitious and otherwise they're in trouble. And of course, in a sense, that's true. There's mm -hmm. the double-edged sword. You're supposed to want it all, but also be able to do everything. But also if you want everything, you're in trouble. Like there's no, for a lot of women, historically, there has been no good answer. Mm -hmm. If you aren't ambitious, then you're not good enough. If you are ambitious, you're a shrew, right? Like right. there's no, there's actually no happy medium. But the whole topic of women and politicians and ambition came up again in this most recent run-up in particular in the moment when Biden was deciding on his VP. Though even before that, mm -hmm. through the whole primary process. Yes, definitely during the primaries. But candidates. it came, it, when I, you know, I remembered that it had gone by and I did a little search 
And when I searched just for mm -hmm. women, uh, female politician ambition, a whole bunch of articles from August came up, which was just mm. when Biden was deciding on Kamala Harris. Right. And, you know, before he decided on her, because specifically there was a, a report that a bunch of Democratic insiders didn't want her to be picked mm. because she was considered too ambitious because she wanted to be president. And people would think, and, and the argument was that she would be focused on becoming president rather than doing a good job as VP. Now, these are people uh, who have nominated a former VP as their presidential pick. Yeah, yeah. So the articles I found were, you know, talking about these problems and about the hypocrisy of it all. And it is, it's, it, the hypocrisy is so openly blatant in that, that it, it's almost laughable, except the world isn't laughable anywhere. No one would have said anything like that about a man, you know, being picked as VP. No, like it, it is actually impossible to imagine somebody saying, Oh, he just wants to be oh, president. Oh, no, yeah, yeah but he, you know, he's very ambitious. He'd like to be president. It would, it would be, mm -hmm. if somebody said that, it would be, oh, well, you know, he'll do a good job because he wants to be president later. Right. That's like just normal. So, you know, I don't need to dwell on it particularly, but just to read the headlines from, so these were all from the beginning of August, from The Hill, why is ambitious a dirty word for female candidates? Or there was one article from the Harvard Gazette saying American voters don't hate ambitious women after all. And it was about a study that had been done. Mm -hmm. But what the study showed was that Democratic voters didn't mind mm -hmm. ambitious women mm -hmm. and Republican voters did. Mm -hmm. So the headline as often is, that's not what it says, actually. That's not what the content was. Yeah. And then another from Vogue from August, again, from the beginning of August, the Veep watch. Some people seem to have a problem with Kamala Harris's ambition. I wonder why. And of course, with her, it's not just that she's a woman. It's also that she's black or yeah. mixed race and therefore that much more problematic that she should dare to be ambitious. Yeah. Shouldn't she just be glad to be nominated as the first VP candidate and, you know, be grateful for that position and grateful for having been chosen. And a lot of this stuff is never made really explicit, but it's there. And I don't care how many YouTube commenters tell us it's yeah. not. It really is. Of course, there are women who get praised for their ambition. There were exceptions to all rules. Mm -hmm. And all of these things happen differently with different people in different contexts. And some people are not bigoted and say the right thing. <laughs> you know, like it's not universal. No. But you know, there is not a single male politician that I can think of over the last 20 years who has ever been criticized for being ambitious. Ever. Mm -hmm. So if any woman ever has, that's evidence of a different standard and more than one has. So just wanted to bring that up because it has become depressingly relevant yeah. again and nothing really, really changed. And I mean, here's a question to ask yourself. You know, when I said the line, ambitious young go-getter, did you what picture a man you or of? did you yeah. picture a woman? Because yeah. I specifically didn't gender it in the script and I can't remember now what I did with the visual. So Yeah. There's the there's an automatic assumption, even if you don't consciously think you're being. Yeah, we've sexist. all been programmed, right? Mm -hmm. This is not about people being bad people no. intrinsically. Yeah. It's 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 the programming that's out there. Mm -hmm. I'm probably guilty of it too, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what do I expect in a female politician? You know, there's a whole there's a whole other realm of this with people having to focus on their motherhood to offset, you know. It's, it's okay to be ambitious as long as you prove that you're also a deeply committed parent, but only women ever have to do that. Men yeah. never have to prove the commitment to their parenting in order to offset their ambition. So there's a whole range of things, but it, it's not about individual people being sexist pigs. Sometimes it is, but it isn't only about yeah. that. It's yeah. also about these really deeply ingrained societal norms. Yeah. Okay. So that was my first just thing I wanted to pull out. But I know you have some other thoughts about stuff you talked about you wanted to expand on. Yeah, a few things that I wanted to sort of clarify or add to. So I mentioned the word poll and that it, it originally meant head, which is why, you know, a poll tax mm -hmm. is taxed by head, essentially. By per person. Per yeah. person. Yeah. Well, it's possible that etymologically, it ultimately comes from the same root as ballot. So I sort of gave the immediate source of the word, but it may be traceable back to that same root for ballot, or at least, you know, one that is related to it. 
Mm. So this is just speculation. But again, to plug Mashed Radish blog posts, he's got a, a post on the word poll. So if you want to hear more about that possible connection, you can you can find out more there. But if so, that would make a nice extra connection tying poll and ballot together. A little clarification on the word writing, specifically as it applies to Canadian politics. I should have said that it's not the official term. So writing hmm. is, it's not in any law election or Canada. election, you know, it's, it's not there. Officially, it's called an electoral district. There is not a single Canadian out who there calls who ever calls it that. And on election night, they all talk about writing on CBC and yeah. everybody. But I mean, I believe that. But but the name is indeed so commonly used that even Elections Canada, which is the body that oversees the elections in mm -hmm. Canada, as the name <laughs> quite accurately <laughs> describes, they do use the term in common contexts. So not in official language. So not in the laws and the policy, but when they're, but when they're telling doing people where to vote you know, or yeah. what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's, if you said electoral district to any Canadian, I think they would think you were talking about the states. Right. Because we're so used to hearing that terminology in yeah. the south. So. But yeah, no, writing is not anywhere written in laws or official, you know, things. And in terms of the etymology of that word, we can see a similar formation to that word thriving mm -hmm. originally in the sense of three parts with the word farthing, mm -hmm. four parts. A farthing is an old denomination of coin in Britain. It no longer is a current part of their decimalized money, but before right. they decimalized, they had farthings and it's worth a quarter of a penny. Right. And in the middle ages, it was even common to produce a farthing by literally cutting a penny in four. Mm-hmm. Right. I've seen pictures of that in a video you happen to be working on Yes. Right now. <laughs> so I was going to say, this is a bit of a teaser for an upcoming video, and I won't tell you how it ties in because it's a bit of a surprise. Mm -hmm. But you can hear more about the farthing and... If the video ever comes out. Yeah. It's a really long video and it's taken a <laughs> long time to make. <laughs> but stay tuned. Mm. I mean... Ideally, it's already out by the time you hear this podcast. If it isn't, we've failed. But the world is very far from ideal right now. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> so staying in Canada, mm -hmm. as one should. As we do, because yeah. we're certainly not traveling anywhere else, are we, Mark? <laughs> right. <laughs> so as for the Canadian Parliament, the upper house is actually called the Senate. And this is a question that I have. I wonder how this term was adopted. I remember doing, trying to do research on this at the time when we you were doing the video it. and we yeah. couldn't, we could, we sort of vaguely tracked down when they first started calling it the Senate, but we saw nothing about discussions about what to call it mm -hmm. because the British upper house is the house of lords. lords. Now we couldn't call it. Obviously we, don't that, we don't have lords. Okay, fine. The American Senate. So do we copy them? Them? So the American version is not an upper house in the same way. No, they're legislators, right? Mm -hmm. When really it doesn't make a lot of sense to call it after the Roman Senate because the Roman Senate was the primary decision-making body. I mean, mm -hmm. the only way in which it makes sense to model it on the, Amer the Roman system would be to say that the assemblies constituted the, constituted the commons. Right. If you, if, okay. if you think of the House of Commons, because we do have a House of Commons. So if you think of the Commons as being the assemblies, the, I say assemblies because there were multiple assemblies, differently constituted groups of the people who were the assemblies. And it's true that they were the ones who technically made laws. They voted on the laws. Okay. And so the Senate had to approve the expenditure of money. Yes. And foreign affairs. Right. But I mean, obviously that's not the way the division happens in Canada, no. but to a certain extent, the Senate is a sort of more select group. Right. I guess if you decide the assemblies are like the, the commons, then the only group left over is the Senate. Senate right. But you'd think there would be this discussion about that. Yeah. In I mean, Canadian politics, the constitution of the House of Commons and all of that is recent enough. You'd think there'd be copious discussions of it because, but we could not find anything in any of the histories of the Senate mm -hmm. or of the parliamentary system. So if anyone knows anything yeah. about that, I'd really like to know. Yeah, if there are any experts on Canadian political history. Was there any debate about it? Was it obvious? Where did it come from? 
even when did the name start? Because mm -hmm. it seems like maybe there were provincial senates before that, like in Upper Canada and Lower mm -hmm. Ca Canada. But now I'm now I'm trying to remember looking right. it up four years ago, so I might be misremembering. But I couldn't find anything very clear about mm -hmm. that. The other question is, are there any other countries that have senates? Doesn't Australia have a senate? Yeah, so Australia has a Senate. It's the upper house of the bicameral parliament, the lower house being the House of Representatives. So they don't call oh, it the House of Commons. Commons, okay. Which but, uh, you know, how, who Senate knows when that not. happened? Maybe they were, you know, Australian electoral history is very different from, from Canadian electoral history. But yeah, I would be very interested if anyone has any idea because we, I was really interested in that. Mm. And I remember trying mm -hmm. to sort of figure it out and I could not find any source for when we started calling it a Senate. Mm -hmm. Also, just a, a sort of word of caution, I greatly simplified the discussion of the history of early U.S. political parties. <laughs> yes. There were, in fact, numerous parties back then with very shifting platforms, and it's super complicated. And so, names, yeah. Yeah. So I, I only touched on, a, you know, a few few elements of that. Mm. I've come back to that topic a few times since, but never with a fully, you know, explained history of that. So for that, I would suggest going to other. Yeah, uh, there are explainers about certain, that sort of yeah, stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mentioned some Icelandic etymologies in there. So I've got another Icelandic etymology to <laughs> add. Always. If you have any way to talk about Icelandic things, always talk about Icelandic things. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I should point out that we indeed visited the All Thing. Or, that's a stretch. We took a bus past, past the All Thing. Though we saw the original All Thing. Yes, that's true. That's we true. Not the one on that we picked her in that video, but yeah. not the real one. Yes, in the time since putting that video out, we have seen that. And that was very exciting. Yes. But of course, you know, this this idea of the All Thing and, and this sort of site that is in the middle of nowhere, kind of. <laughs> and they would go, and it was kind of the middle of nowhere then too. I, yeah, clearly always was. And what they would do is they'd go and set up these temporary dwellings on this site that was away from any settlements. And they would go and, and set up these temporary dwellings that, you know, the, the attendees of these old, you know, medieval councils stayed in. And they were called booths. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where we get the modern English word booth from. It's, you know, it is the old Norse version of the word booth. So it comes from a Germanic root that means to dwell. So the old Danish word is both uh, temporary dwelling and the East Norse source of that is boa to dwell. And it comes from the Proto-Germanic root boan and also gives us the second element in words such as neighbor, the boar part in mm, neighbor mm -hmm. is that, and husband, the mm. band part of husband. So it's, it's sort of house dweller. Yeah. Right. And it goes back to the Proto-Indo-European root that means to be, to exist, that gives us the word be. Right. And it's the, the Proto-Indo-European root bewe, so to be, to exist, to grow. Okay. And it is obviously found in many daughter languages of Proto-Indo-European. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're interested in this word booth, there is a wonderfully detailed blog post written by Anatoly Lieberman, who, who is the Oxford etymologist, is his handle. And really, if you're interested in etymology and the really deep etymologies, Lieberman's posts are just amazing. Mm -hmm. so we'll link to these, of course, yeah. anything Mark mentions. A few other references that connect this video to other things, other mm -hmm. videos and or podcasts that mm -hmm. we've done. If you want to hear more about that whole stuff about architecture that I reference. Mm -hmm. So the neoclassical the and gothic, gothic yeah, architecture. That's sublime, right? Sublime. Yeah. And I, I go into that in super detail. So if well, you, you say that, but it's, it's not 55 minutes long. So <laughs> I don't think you can call it real detail. Is, is that a challenge? No. <laughs> <laughs> it is not. <laughs> yeah. The video on sublime. Yeah. And if that name Thomas Nast brings a bell. You've talked about him like 75 comes up, times. Yeah, all the time. Uh, I think the earliest mention of Nast was in the cocktail video, which is right from the early days. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have definitely done a podcast of that. Mm -hmm. And his connection to that first celebrity bartender, Jerry Thomas, who also comes up a bazillion times. Mm -hmm. 
And they both come up in later videos, I think most recently in Manhattan. Manhattan. Yeah. So there you go. Now, another thing I wanted to expand on is this very offensive term, idiot. Mm -hmm. Which I'm not going to lie. I have trouble getting out of yeah. my vocabulary. I'm not in any way disputing the offensiveness of the term, mm -hmm. but you know, it's there like crazy. Yeah. It's a word that I know I should not use and I do not want to use and I use it. I know. And I'm just, I'm copying to that right now because yeah, I'm the, it's... I'm the same. It's really hard because, you know... It's emotive and it's built into a bunch of phrases mm -hmm. and it feels like there isn't another option, mm -hmm. which isn't true, but it does feel like there isn't something else that has the same force yeah. of vitriol that I want it to have. And I know that. I know it's a problem and I need to deal with it. And we grew up using these words without oh, all the anyone, time, without any thinking. Without yeah. anyone pointing out that these were problematic words. No, right? they weren't thought of as problematic. That's not an excuse. It's not it's an just, excuse. It's but... in my brain mm -hmm. and I'm trying to work on it. So I've probably used it and I apologize, but mm -hmm. that doesn't, you know, apologies aren't helpful. Being better is helpful. <laughs> well, there are a number of other words that that guy Goddard, the eugenicist. There's always a eugenicist. I know. Like it doesn't matter uh, what video, how many of our videos do not, not have an eugenicist, eugenicist in yes. them? <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Well, so he had a whole system of categories, right? Mm -hmm. Defining different levels of. Which got turned into, I mean, I remember, so my grandfather worked with kids with special needs mm -hmm. as a teacher and then a principal through his life. And he worked in a system which used those designations yeah. as like meaningful and useful mm -hmm. and not, no, they didn't sterilize anybody. Like, don't get yeah. me wrong here. He was trying to help. And, and I think he, within the constructs of his time, did a lot of good. Mm -hmm. I don't think he did evil, but he worked in a system where, you know, he differentiated morons from idiots, from different, you know, people. Those were, those were meaningful terms to him. So in a yeah. sense, he wasn't using them loosely the way I do. Yeah. He was using them for According to, to Goddard's, people, um, people with certain levels of IQ. And I'm not, that's not a defense, I'm, but you know, that, that mm -hmm. is, that's how close it is, I guess yeah. is what I'm trying to mm -hmm. say. You know, these were people when he, you know, slow kids and retarded kids, which is the other, another, another, another term, term yeah. which is of course a problematic term in like, it's not even a strong enough term. It's, it's an abusive, mm -hmm. offensive term, but that was also, you know, these terms, this is the pejoration, right? Like yeah. they're technical terms, then they become terms of abuse and then they become offensive terms that have to be removed from our vocabulary. And he was in a different phase of that mm -hmm. time. And so that's, you know, that was 40 years ago. That's not that long ago that these were being used in school boards. Mm -hmm. It's, I guess, what I'm pointing out. So yeah, we grew up with very different terminology and we're trying to change that. So yeah, although these terms are really awful, looking at their etymologies is at least instructive mm -hmm. as to, you know, why they're so bad. And idiot in Greek didn't, no, it didn't. have the yeah. same. So that's a later... <laughs> It's a later development it's, well, it's of the word. Yeah, right? it's his Goddard's fault. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the word imbecile, another of Goddard's terms, it comes into English through French from Latin. So the prefix in, that's the negative prefix, mm -hmm. meaning, you know, not. And baculum, which means stick. So it's <laughs> like a walking stick is what right, you want to yeah. picture here. So the idea is that someone is weak because they lack support in baculum, no stick. And this weakness narrowed in sense to refer to those who are weak in the mind rather than physically weak. Right, right. The term moron comes ultimately from Greek, from Greek moros, meaning foolish or stupid. And there isn't an earlier etymon for this. There does seem to be a Sanskrit cognate, mora. So we don't, it hasn't been adequately mapped out. We don't have the we don't evidence. don't have enough, enough versions in enough languages to really do it. Yeah. yeah. Now, just because I found this, Goddard had written an opinion about democracy. So I thought it's kind of relevant here. Mm -hmm. So he says, quote, democracy then means that the people rule by selecting the wisest, most intelligent, and most human to tell them what to do to be happy. Now, I'm not sure that this really fits with most people's definition of democracy today. No. We don't want to be told what to do by our leaders. No. Really. And that wouldn't be the 
you know, that's not the rule of the people. No. I think the way that most people think of democracy now is we tell our leaders broadly what we, what we want. And then they and work they out figure the nitty gritty of it. Like they yeah. do the, yeah. they do the stuff none of us want to do because we don't have the time for it. Right. Yeah. The figuring out how to spend the money and pass the laws. How and, to carry out the ideals. We have mm -hmm. these very generalized ideals and we say, this is what I believe in and you can do that for me, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very party centric thinking. Yeah. Right. That's I how, suppose. and, and I, mm -hmm. I, I think that's how most modern democracies work. Maybe all of them. It, it's a little different than a politician makes a bunch of promises and then we hold them to it. I mm -hmm. think there's actually a real tension between those two models yeah, of right. democracy right now. You're right. And uh, a contradictory tension where we both kind of want both. Mm. You know, the anger at people who flip flop or don't fill their promises. Mm. And yet if I trusted them to hold my ideals and then go into parliament, then if they changed their mind, I would trust that they did so for reasons that were, mm -hmm. you know, you make a bunch of promises before you're elected and then you go into and you find out all the details and you know you can't carry them out. Or something changes. Or something changes. In theory, if I trusted my representatives to have the same value system as I had, mm -hmm and that's why I'd elected them, then I would trust them to change their views in response to changing information. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And like sensible people should change their views when they see changing information. And yet there's this discourse of the worst thing a politician can do is not fulfill their promises or break mm -hmm. their promises or, or flip flop on a subject. And those two, that's not consistent. You can't actually yeah. hold like those don't make sense. They are opposing views. So I suppose it, it comes down to the difference between, you know, what was originally conceived of as a representative democracy, where you, you elect someone who represents you. Who has the same interests yeah. and the same maybe background and views. Mm -hmm. yeah. And voter as consumer, mm -hmm. right? You buy a thing and you want to be delivered. And I want that delivered. promise. You yeah. know, if, if, you don't, if you don't do these seven things you said on your list, then mm -hmm. you have failed me as a, mm -hmm. yeah. Or as a contract, like it's a business proposition. Yeah. I don't have an answer to that because I've, you know, I have felt both ways right. about politicians I have voted for. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't vote for Trudeau, but he, he said he was going to change the electoral system and he didn't. He did. yeah. And I feel like that was a hundred percent a broken promise. Mm -hmm. And yet other things, maybe he changed because the world changed and he had to change. And mm -hmm. so I, I'm not consistent in my views on that either. So I don't mm -hmm. know what to do about it. But I think these are different models. The word democracy is used now to encompass such a wide range of different views about how the relationship between the voter yeah. or the citizen, which is not the same as the voter and the politician, you know, what is that relationship? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good and important point to make about the difference between democracy in the ancient world in the few places there were democracies or systems where there were democratic aspects like Rome, mm -hmm. which had democratic aspects in the sense that we mean democratic. The differences between them and now and what people thought they were getting and the reasons for doing it. The whole beginning of this was you talking about that. So, yeah. yeah. So on that note, I think I finally, I, I want to just talk a little bit more about politics in the ancient world mm -hmm. in Athens and in Rome. So let's start with Athens and you can kind of expand on mm -hmm. this general outline that I'm giving. So in Athens, in ancient Athens, though opinions about democracy were indeed mixed, as I sort of indicated. Yeah. And over time too, it's yes. very important to say that the democratic period of Athens was fairly short. Yeah. So not only are we not talking about all of Greece, so, <laughs> you know, people say, oh, Greece, the home of democracy. So Athens. <laughs> no, other places uh, had democracies yeah. too. Though we don't um, know much we as don't much know about nearly them. as much about them and they had different varieties of it for different periods. Athens supported mm -hmm. democracies in different places while they had it. Like it was very complicated, but yes, there's no such thing as Greece in the ancient world. Yeah. So let's just dispense with that right away. <laughs> so yes, we're talking about, we're talking about Athens because that's what the system we know. Yeah. Athens over about a, what, 150 years approximately. <sighs> So the peak of Athenian democracy goes from basically the fifth century with some problems in between in yeah. the middle of the Peloponnesian War. There are then a restoration of the democratic system on and off in the fourth century. So there's little Pockets. patches mm -hmm. of democratic, more or less democratic systems. Because of course, when we're talking about the real peak of Athenian democracy, the full on Athenian democracy, that's only actually in the fifth century, that's only maybe 60 or 70 years mm -hmm. of that 
range where it was at its most democratic. And I don't mean that in a modern sense. Right. I in, mean, in the, Greek in the, sense. In Athenian, in the Athenian sense, Athenian it was sense. the most yeah. democratic. Yeah. A really important point, And I don't know if this is what you're going to say. I might be heading you off. But one of the really key things is that the Athenian democracy in its most democratic form did not, in fact, elect most of their officials. Yes. So this was a point I was going to yeah. make. Go ahead. So, well, so I've got a few things to right, kind of go ahead get up to that point. Say, yeah. Although they had this sort of mixed opinion about this, that didn't stop them from personifying the concept as a goddess, democratia. Mm -hmm. I mean, they but love they, to personify they everything. everything, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they did make offerings to her. Mm -hmm. Now, their assembly, their, you know, kind of political mm -hmm. assembly was called the Ecclesia, mm -hmm. which means literally calling out. Mm -hmm. And the word was later adopted to refer to the church in Christian times. So from political assembly, it became religious assembly. Yeah, a because it just, meant, it just meant people who were called together, together in order to make decisions. Yeah. So it, they just modeled the church forms on the yeah. political forms. Yeah. So from ecclesia, we get the English word ecclesiastic or ecclesiastical. Mm -hmm. As to voting, it was initially done by a show of hands without an exact count. Mm -hmm. Just like the you sort of estimate. Yeah. Ballots were, however, used in the law courts, so actual counted ballots. And one particular instance of voting in that very specific ballot sense in ancient Greece is ostracism, mm -hmm. in which, you know, that was the exiling of someone who was thought to be dangerous to the state. They would be exiled for 10 years and it would be decided. Exiled, uh, but they did not lose their property. It's an important point right. because normally exile entailed it was a capital of punishment. You became a non-person, a non-citizen. Yes, you became a non-citizen. And also your property was seized, so your heirs did not inherit the it. heirs did not inherit it. Whereas yeah. with ostracism, you went away for 10 years, but your property was not confiscated. And then you could and come you back. And you could come back. Yeah. yeah. It was meant to reduce the political power of a person. Right. It wasn't really a punishment, in other words. The people it who was, were ostracized right. were often people who were very popular. It was a solution to a problem. It was solution to people being too popular. Too popular. Right. So in this case of ostracism, voting was done with pottery fragments, which in Greek are called, well, it's called an ostracon, mm -hmm. a pottery fragment, a, sh a shard. <laughs> so this word ostracon is related to the word osteon, which meant bone, mm -hmm. from which we get medical terms like osteoporosis and osteoarthritis and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's also related to the word ostreon, which means oyster. Mm -hmm. And from that, we get the word oyster. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Now, so this is the bit that you were referring to. The most notable difference between Athenian democracy and our modern systems is that with the exception of some military positions, which, you know, required specialized abilities and knowledge, government officials were not elected, but chosen by lot. Mm -hmm. It was a lottery. <laughs> <laughs> and that is like a serious and important distinction. And when people talk about Athenian democracy as the origins of, say, American democracy, it's not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it is true because, of course, that idea of popular rule mm -hmm. was very influential and very important. And when countries later modeled themselves deliberately on Athenian democracy, that matters. And we should talk about that. But the, there were very few in the height of Athenian democracy. Mm -hmm. So there are a whole bunch of different stages. It was the strategoi who were the generals who were elected because, yes, they had to have real skills. You couldn't just throw any person in yeah. charge of the army and expect them to you win a battle. You couldn't be terrible at strategy and hope to win a war. So. No, it was that was important. So the strategoi, and there were 10 of them mm -hmm. regularly. So, for instance, Pericles, whom people will know as a name, probably from Athens, was elected as a strategoi. That's why it mattered that he was popular because he was actually elected. Mm. And there were a couple of archons who were at various points elected, and those were other kinds of officials. But almost everyone else in the height of democracy was just chosen by lot. And there was mm. a whole very complicated system for marking who was eligible mm -hmm. and how that worked. And these really cool machines too for choosing people. And it was considered your duty, your mm -hmm. civic duty to to do that job when your your when name your number came, came up. <laughs> you you had to do it and there was a they were fairly short one year one terms, year terms yeah. usually. In fact there were some other there were like the Prittanies and things like that were actually even shorter than that. Now where the voting came in was the voting for laws. Right. 
and that was voting. Direct it was, it democracy. It was direct democracy. You yeah. had to turn up on the day and you had to stand there and you listened to the people arguing for the different points and then you made your vote on the day in person. So, you know, that's the part that is democratic in the sense that we think of as democratic. Right. People proposed laws mm -hmm. or actions like going to war or not and taxes and stuff. And that was voted on. So that was voting for sure. And that was, that's more like what the Icelandic, Mm -hmm. You know, the all thing was, was now it's, voting on specific issues. Yeah. And now we would we would call that a referendum now mm -hmm. if we did that, which we do very rarely. But some, you know, so California has referendums all the time. Australia, New Zealand, like some places have them more often than others. And that is very much closer to the original mm -hmm. direct democracy. Now, I should say with reference to the Icelandic democracy, of course, there were shenanigans that went on in the background oh, don't to tell, influence how people voted. Of course, voted. there were shenanigans in, in <laughs> Athens too. Like, don't let anybody try to pretend to you yeah. that it was some sort of pure and, I mean, we have lots of stuff about bribery and mm -hmm. corruption. And, and also most people, you know, this is the drawback to direct democracy. Most people don't have time to think about mm -hmm. the uh, issues. Right. And so they follow influential people. Yeah. So you know, Pericles was a strategos, but he was also an influential speaker that people just generally trusted. Right. So when he said, we're going to do X, everyone voted for X because he got his people trusted him. And the other thing that's important to understand about Athenian democracy, quite apart from the fact that, you know, women couldn't vote, blah, 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 blah. If you weren't a landowner, if you weren't an Athenian citizen, if you didn't have enough land, you couldn't vote. Though in the very height of the democracy, anyone could vote. You didn't have to mm -hmm. have any land at all or money. And that was, that was the thing people hated the most about it was that like even poor people had a vote. It's horrible. And it How wasn't, can you imagine that. And it wasn't just a question of whether or not you were born in Athens. It's whether your entire lineage came from Athens. Again, at, at the most times. restrictive yeah. periods. Yeah. yeah. But the other really important thing to realizes, you know, so at the height of the democracy, you were paid. If you went to the assembly, you got a little bit of money, like not a lot, but a little bit of money for attending the assembly. And if you went and were a jury, that's the other really important thing about democracy is that all the court cases had large juries, mm -hmm. you know, like 500 people mm -hmm. or a hundred people and you were paid for jury duty. And it was the fact that the general people were chosen by lot to be jury members that was considered one of the hallmarks of Athenian democracy. Mm -hmm. So actually the fact that they voted on laws was actually not that unusual in many Greek states. In many Greek states, the laws were proposed by small councils, but voted on by the assembly of people mm -hmm. to some degree, maybe it was restricted by property qualifications or something, mm -hmm. but it was still voted on by the people. But the idea that the court cases were decided by the people at large mm -hmm. was actually the thing that other Greek states thought was the most surprising about Athens, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. But at the height of the democracy, you were paid a little bit of money for that. But basically, the reason you could have direct democracy, where people spent many days out of the year standing around in an assembly, mm -hmm. listening to people make speeches and voting and not at their farms and not at their shops and not at their work. Why could they do that? Slavery. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really important to understand that the reason people had that liberty to spend their time doing this, and even if they weren't, you know, investigating every single piece of information about policy, but being able to kind of make something of a reasonably informed decision about a lot of this was because they had enslaved people mm -hmm. to do their work. And that's really important to understand when we talk about Greek democracy and Athenian democracy. The liberty of Athens mm -hmm. was enabled by a very large number of people with no freedom. And that's, wow, what a surprise that America modeled themselves on that. Yeah. Now, I have this vague memory of reading this, and you can correct me if this is wrong, but I mean, obviously, slavery was an institution in many, Everywhere. many parts of the ancient world and many parts of all of them, Greek as far as city I know. states. Yeah. But at that particular time, Athens had a big number of people, enslaved yeah. people. I mean, this is one of these things we, it's hard to know because we of the different sources of information, but yes. Athens, From war, it was? Athens they, is generally considered in the 5th century to be a slave economy and slave state mm -hmm. in a way that not all Greek states were. 
Right. So I don't know that I can get much more specific than that without more knowledge than I have. But yes, not all states had the level of enslaved labor mm. available to them that Athens did. I think that is definitely true. And Athens didn't always have that much mm -hmm. either. So that's, you know, the rise of democracy at Athens comes along with the rise right. of their economy and ability to have large numbers of enslaved people. Right. So, And we see that at, at Rome too. Right. Even though Rome didn't have a direct democracy quite the same way, the ability of Roman citizens to be so deeply engaged with politics definitely comes along with the rise of slave an enslaved, economy. yeah, a slave economy, a, a, right. a large enslaved population. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at least anyways, in theory, having this democratic system meant that you know, you didn't get the same kind of political campaigns and it prevented the sort of development of an exclusive political class as in Rome. Yeah. And that was definitely the purpose of it. Mm -hmm. If everybody is eligible for holding these positions and it's all rotated on a basically random basis, nobody's going to be a career politician right. because it's no such thing as a career. So there will be like a handful, maybe these people who become strategoi, but that's mostly that they're soldiers. Yeah. And otherwise, there will be people who will have influence in the assembly. Hmm. And that still happened. Mm -hmm. But there won't be people who would just live their life going from office to office because it's random. Right. And in fact, once you've held an office, you're removed from eligibility for that office for X number of years. Right. They were really big on amateurs. They wanted amateurs to hold these offices. <laughs> no, I mean, they did. Yeah. They really did. Mm -hmm. They didn't want them to be professionals. Mm -hmm. Now, there's drawbacks to that, yeah. right? Especially because they didn't really have the bureaucracy, which it's okay to have an amateur in charge if you have... Experts who if are... You have, yeah. Telling them, well, okay, this will work or this won't yeah. work or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there were drawbacks to it. But mm -hmm. in a small state with a reasonably simple economy and foreign policy, it's maybe doable. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is now. No. And we've seen that go very Horribly badly. wrong. <laughs> in modern times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, speaking of Rome then, so in ancient Rome, voting was initially oral with officials who were called rogatores, mm -hmm. literally questioners, <laughs> who would ask each voter for their vote and then would write it down. Mm -hmm. Because of course you don't have a literate society. Yeah. But later on, they developed secret ballots. Uh, yeah. And before that, you had to go and you had to declare it in front of everybody. And we have lots of evidence of like... This is problematic. Strong men <laughs> and like yeah. standing next to the place where you had to declare your I vote going you like... on the head if you don't. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think you're going to vote for? You're going to vote for my guy or not? You know? And that was something people had to campaign for was a secret ballot because it was so very obviously being manipulated yeah. by basic threats and also bribes. Right. Because, of course, you bribe people to vote for you, but if there's a secret ballot, you don't know if you they did know. or not. Yeah. So mm -hmm. nobody liked that. You know, yeah. the people who had the money to bribe didn't like right. the idea that they wouldn't know if people had actually followed through or not. Right. Yeah. It was a big thing. So these secret ballots, I, I gather, involved wax tablets. That seems easy to, I mean, never mind hanging chads. I mean, you could, could you just like <laughs> scrape off a little thing? Well, and, you have to have the right you know, people counting. Be right. That's the important point. <laughs> so, you know, in terms of how the mechanics, the mathematical mechanics of mm -hmm. uh, voting worked in, in Rome, it's not a question of simple majorities, but voting blocks, which right. decided elections, which really reminds me of the whole crazy electoral college system in the U.S., I don't even want to talk about, I don't want to talk about assemblies at Rome. It's complicated oh from what God. I gather. It is so upsettingly complicated. Okay. In my Roman Civ class, I'm like, here are what they are. And now we're all going to forget that immediately because that was too hard. Mm. So I'm not going to go over it all. But there were different, as I said, different blocks could be constituted different ways. Like centuries? Is that the term? It's one. So there was the centuriate assembly. Mm hmm which was organized by centuries, which were the groups in which you fought in the army. Right. Because most originally, to be an enfranchised citizen, you had to be an, an army in the army. Yeah. That was... Or to put it another way, if you were a citizen, you were expected to, to go No, and, uh, No, right? it's sort of not, because originally you could only be in the army if you had a certain property qualification. 
Right. Okay. So right. it was complicated, but you nonetheless were a citizen, even if you couldn't be in the army in terms of, say, protections of your person. Okay. People couldn't beat you in the street and mm -hmm. you weren't allowed to be executed without trial because you were still a citizen. But there's the Centurion Assembly, which is organized by centuries. There's another one that is only the Plebeian Assembly. So only if you're a plebeian are you a member of that assembly. And mm -hmm. so if you're a member of the patrician class, you cannot be a member of that assembly. So the Plebeian Assembly elects the Plebeian Tribunes, the tribunes. for Right. The tribunes of the people. Any of the assemblies can vote on laws. So people would decide which assembly to call depending on whether they thought of that particular arrangement of voters would right. pass okay. the law or not. So one of the assemblies is the one that is organized by census grade. Mm -hmm. And then that means by how much money you have. And then there's the tribal assembly, which is arranged by the tribes, which are sort of originally where you lived and your family lived, but then became divorced from geography, much like the deems did in, in Athens after a certain amount of time. And there were only, there were certain ones that were the city of Rome, and then there were other ones that were outside of the city of Rome. And then there was this whole issue when the allies of Rome became Italians, became Roman citizens, which tribes would they be in? Because you voted, yes, by voting blocks. So the tribal assemblies would vote by the tribe, which was sort of your kinship group, but not really. And each group would vote and the majority vote of that group would then decide. So say it was yes or no, you, yeah. right? It's all or nothing. If, 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 if the majority of the group in that tribe voted yes, then that tribal vote counts. That tribe counts as one, one. yes vote. Yeah. And you would add those up. Now, that's not so bad with the tribal assembly because those are geographical, though it means that there's most of the tribes were in Rome and there were only a few that were assigned to outside of Rome. So the people inside of Rome had this high level mm. of power. But the centurion assembly was arranged by money. Hmm. So the top, let's say 1% was in one century and then the next 5% of, so it was by levels of income, right? you know, how much property, not income, property, property did you own? And so you were organized into these groups and they voted and each block voted and then each block counted for one. But, you know, the top 1%, the, the top century had maybe like, I don't know, let's say 500 people in it. The bottom century, which was the people who had no money at all, had maybe, let's say, 10,000 people in it. Yeah, right. But that century counted for one, one vote, vote and the top 500 people counted for, for one, one vote. vote. Yeah. Even better, when they recorded the votes, they started from the top and they went until they got a simple majority. Right. And so, they didn't even ask the votes of the bottom, bottom half. Off, right. So if, if the first five or 10 or 15 centuries all voted one way. That was it. That was it. So the Centurion Assembly then is the one that you go to if it's going to appeal to the upper classes, right? Right. Or the rich people. But the Plebeian Assembly, which rules a lot of those upper classes out because the patricians are generally the ones with all the money, though it doesn't necessarily track that way, blah, blah, blah. You might go to for others. So different magistrates were allowed to call different assemblies. Mm. Some magistrates could call all of the assemblies or not all of the assemblies. And they would do so. And then the different assemblies also voted for different magistrates. Right. So each of the assemblies voted for particular magistrates. So when the elections were held for consul and ideals and tribunes of the plebs and stuff, it was different assemblies mm. would vote for each of those. I don't know how any Roman kept any of this straight. It's <laughs> utterly baffling to me but i mean i guess whatever the way that you do it is the way that yeah. you do it you know like people figure these things out but it's so and yeah no pretense of every vote is equal hmm. none like nobody even tried to pretend that that was true <laughs> so americans as you look at your unbelievably complex from what i understand <laughs> ballots and are it's baffled <laughs> yeah that, that, that goes back a long way so the, the romans feel your pain <laughs> Yeah, they only ever had one simple ballot to do at a time, but they had a lot of voting to do. It took them a <laughs> lot of days to vote. So same deal. So in terms of popularism in Roman politics, I mean, we can talk about sort of basically two major factions from what I understand, the populares who appealed to the lower classes and the, you know, the popular assembly to achieve their political ends. Right. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Populares, the thing about them was that they would call the popular assembly right. or the plebeian assembly to do what they wanted. It didn't mean that they were necessarily themselves from the lower classes or right. in fact even cared about the lower classes, but they felt they could draw their power and their support from the popular assembly. Right. So they had ideas that were 
you know, palatable to those palatable groups. To those groups. Yeah. And then on the other hand, there was the sort of ruling elite, I guess you could say, who stressed the authority of the Senate. Mm -hmm. They were known, at least to themselves, <laughs> as the optimates, meaning literally the best. I don't yes. know the others would call them, would have called them that, but you no. know. See, this is where the history is written by the victors part comes in. Right. Because the people whose stories we hear are the people who can call themselves the optimates. Right. <laughs> so now that said, like Julius Caesar was a popular. Popularis. Yeah. So it's not only, but, and that's an important point. He was a long term patrician. His family was an old upper class family. There was no way in which he was a man of the people mm -hmm. in the sense of coming from the people, mm -hmm. but he decided his support base would be, and he cultivated a support base among plebeians and the popularis. I guess it makes sense in that he spent a lot of his time with the rank and file in the military. Yeah, it was still a choice. There were lots of generals who were, you know, who were optimates. Like, mm. you know, Pompey ended up siding with the op optimates. He didn't Even, do so well, though, in the end. No, but he did well for a long time. Mm. He did. I mean, don't just because he lost the Civil War in the very end. Mm. I mean, he was extraordinarily successful politically for a very long time. And he was not from a patrician family. Mm. And yet he sided with the optimates and his, but, and yet he was a popular general with his troops, right? So it's, mm. it was complicated. Okay. It was not, it was not as predictable as you might think it would be. Yeah. But yeah, indeed, the, the leaders of both groups, as you suggest, are kind of elite senatorial yeah, class everybody, people. So everybody who was actually a politician was. You've elite. got to have the means to that, mm -hmm. to do that job. Um, because it's very important to know that in the ancient world, in both Greece and Rome, but especially in Rome, no one was paid. Right. No governmental magisterial position. Like, so none of these magistrates was paid for the job. In fact, often you had to use your own private funds to fund the job you took. Mm -hmm. So if you had, if part of your job was to put on games, for instance, you'd be given a certain amount of money from the state, but then you were expected, you know, expected to put your money towards putting on those games. Right. So people did make money from being government officials in roundabout and slightly underhanded right. and sometimes deeply raw fraudulent ways. But the actual job itself did not have a salary. There was no pay. Right. Involved with any of these positions. So, yes, you had to have money like Joe Blow on the street couldn't run for office because he couldn't afford the money for campaigning. And then he couldn't afford to hold the office because he wouldn't be able to do his normal job. And he'd have to spend his own money on paying for people to do the actual work. In mm. fact, like you didn't even get a staff mm. in the Republic. You weren't given a staff. You used your own friends, relations, freedmen and slaves to do the grunt work of the job. So, yeah, it definitely was not a role that everybody could do. <laughs> so, yes, we shouldn't think of the populares as proto-Marxists. or anything No, like that. goodness, no. <laughs> they were populist in the same way that populist politicians tend to be now, which is from the moneyed classes, but appealing to people who don't have necessarily as much money. A certain someone we might. I can't think of anyone that that would apply to. Hmm. No. So this political situation is one of the major features of Roman politics, uh, especially during the later Republic or the, you know, however you want to define that. No, oh, the mid, mid to late mid Republic. To late yeah. Republic. Yeah. So yeah, as you say, Julius Caesar, he was one of the populares. Cicero was an optimate. Mm -hmm. so Even you can see he... why they didn't get along, I guess. Yeah. Though Cicero came from a provincial family who mm. didn't have previous connections, you know. So hmm. There's a lot of psychology involved in looking right. at why these people ended up where they were. Yeah. So, you know, this is all, you know, not too dissimilar from modern politics mm -hmm. in the U S and many other countries where even though the political platforms of the parties may be aimed at, you know, the working class or the middle class or the, you know, mm -hmm. upper class or whatever, groups, yeah. the politicians themselves usually end up coming from the wealthy elite because you can't afford to, to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to put yourself out there and promote yourself and that takes money and, mm -hmm. you know, the time, which itself is money mm -hmm. to do it. So, you know, some things politically don't change when well, we've talked about how, you know, words and culture, words have, and culture changed, have changed, yeah. but some elements are kind of consistent, you know, especially the, the sort of financial side of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.
though ambition no longer directly means bribery. Right. Which it did mean in the ancient <laughs> in world. In the ancient world, yes. It came to mean. And on that happy note... <laughs> I'm sorry if you're listening to this on election day or afterwards, because I really don't know what the results will be. And I, I don't even know. I don't know what I, I don't even want to say what I hope because hope seems such a fragile thing right now. Mm. But yes, to there being more elections in the future. Yes. As problematic as they sometimes are. We can only hope that they continue to happen. Yeah. Cheers. And we'll be back eventually with another podcast. Bye for now. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.